All right. Welcome, everybody, to another author chat on SFF Addicts. And today I have the pleasure of chatting with Robert Jackson Bennett. He's the award-winning author of the Divine Cities Trilogy, the Founders Trilogy, as well as the standalone novels American Elsewhere, The Company Man, Mr. Shivers, and more. And his latest release is Locklands, the third and final book in the Founders Trilogy, which is out on June 28th. So welcome to the show, Robert. How are you doing today? Doing good. How are you? I'm doing very good. Uh, before we dig into the interview, I want to congratulate you on the soon-to-be-released Locklands and concluding the Founders trilogy. So, how do you feel about everything in the lead-up to release? It's uh, it's kind of interesting. This was one I started this uh, the final one in, in October of 2019, mm-hmm. and um, I'd like I I had planned uh, planned this ending for a really long time. Um, so it feels like this has been like years, years, years in the making, especially because this was my my pandemic book. Um, so, Mm -hmm. uh, this was the one that I wrote throughout all of the everything. Um, and, uh, that felt especially long. So it does feel like it's been like a lifetime, like writing this book. Yeah. Longer than actually reading the, writing the two books in the, in the, in the trilogy that started everything. And then the final one feels like it takes even longer. Yeah, it definitely does. Yeah. (laughs) Cool. And I like to ask my guests this at the beginning, just to give listeners and viewers a better sense of you, your history with SFF. Uh, what was your relationship with reading and sci-fi fantasy, that kind of stuff growing up? Um, that's, a, that's a good question. I read all kinds of books when I was a kid in high school. Um, I was actually just chatting with uh, some friends about this, where like, I apparently like, I don't scan as a nerd or as a geek. Like, I scan as average. Um, where people like <laughs> think like, let, like if I tell people that I write science fiction and fantasy, I don't think that they entirely believe me. Um, and I'm on my nerd <laughs> friends. Like I just, just like, don't have like nerd cred, but, uh, yeah. my son just, just got into the Hobbit. And so he started to ask me questions about that. And immediately I was like, well, like I started to just vomit like elf history on him. Um, so <laughs> when I was like, in high school, I was like, the thing that I was super into was Tolkien. Um, and like mm-hmm. I read, uh, all the, like I, like I found, like my mom just dumped off a huge like box of all my crap, but because they just moved and there's like boxes and boxes of maps, of, like books of maps of like the various ages, uh, the various battles, the journeys, like, and like, like, you know, a, like a lot of this stuff is from like 1992 or three. So some of it is just like someone had like a CAD like program and just had some fun with it and then like made a book of maps and sold it, which good for them. Uh, but, Damn, that's um, so cool. <laughs> yeah, I was really, really into that stuff. So, um, and, uh, like, I don't know, like I I've read all kinds of science fiction and fantasy, but mostly fantasy as a kid. Um, I'm not totally sure why. I think that that was just kind of the way that the genre sat at the moment. Like when I was a kid, uh, mm-hmm. uh, growing up, you read, you read fantasy and you watched science fiction. There wasn't a lot of like, like fantasy yeah. TV or fantasy movies. It was like lots that of science fiction. Too. And fantasy. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, when, when did you decide, you know, you got these books that you grew up with, the science fiction that you watched, did you decide, you know, I want to become a writer? Uh, and then how did that journey kind of kick off and, and what was it like at the beginning? Sure. Um, I had a bunch of little moments um, that kind of pushed me toward that. Like one of the first times where I, where I thought like maybe this is something that I could do was in junior high. The third uh, like like Warcraft game was coming out and no one knew like what it looked like, but they had, they had forums. This is back when like the internet was fun. Uh, they had forums where you could post and <laughs> speculate and like, like debate stuff. And then they had a section called fan fiction. And it was really easy to write fan fiction about this stuff because it hadn't been released yet. So I wrote some stories mm. that were probably terrible, uh, but people really liked them. Um, and someone said, like, you're like, I had a few people say, like, you're really good at this. And I remember like being so excited. This is a super goofy moment. I recall being so excited about that stuff that I jumped to go and tell my mom and hit my head on the top of the door frame. I uh, don't know why I would like that. <laughs> that memory has stayed, stayed with me. Very like but, um, 80s moment. Later, like, 80s movie for, moment. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, I kept writing um, for like forums and things like that. And it wasn't until college that I read uh, Neil Gaiman and like basically the mix mm. of like to take a fantasy element and to weave it into the like uh, like urban environment to weave myths into 
uh, the everyday world. Um, that was something that I hadn't experienced yet. I thought that was super cool. And I started thinking maybe I should try and write that stuff. Um, and then I did it. <laughs> uh, I like, I tried to do that a little bit, but that was very much, um, I feel like a moment that, um, like that was a genre moment where a lot of people were, were coming out yeah. trying to write myths and things like that and weave them into, uh, the everyday world. And then I feel like that kind of hit its peak and then it just kind of kept going. Um, and, yeah. uh, for like, I, 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 like I started to find that my strength really lay in trying to build out new worlds with their own plots, with their own, like, uh, like power structures and, uh, political systems and things like that. That was kind of my sweet spot. And I just kind of gravitated toward that. Yeah. And then, I mean, eventually, you know, you started writing more, I guess in that sort of vein, it's like genre bending type stuff with elements of horror and whatnot you know, with Mr. Shivers and, and your earlier works kind of what, uh, what made you kind of pursue that a little bit more seriously? And then later on, you eventually tran transitioned into fantasy. So what was that transition like? Uh, well, I had always thought that I wrote fantasy, like I wrote Shivers and it was like, um, like a depression era. It's, it is pretty much a fantasy story in that there's a group of like, like a ragtag group of people with, with um, like all different skills and they have to travel across a, a strange uh, like wilderness in pursuit of something uh, and there's myths and lore and magic and stuff like that. Uh, but it was just all like structured very um, unusually. Um, it was basically, I think that, mm. Lots of uh, young white dudes who write who probably have too many uh, degrees eventually always try and do something where they want to sound like uh, Cormac McCarthy. And that was mine. Yeah. Um, because they want to be super <laughs> serious and like nihilistic and have really dense prose uh, because that's cool, man. Um, and that was mine. And then that got published, uh, which, I don't, which I have got a mixed feelings about um because it's not really representative of what i went on to do more or what i was good at mm, right. um and you really can't do it again uh you can't make that your thing about like yeah here's another hobo book uh with magic. <laughs> um and, and and also that was at a moment when people thought horror was going to take off so we got uh put into the horror vein and um what they didn't know was that at the time that horror meant just zombies that that's what's successful as zombies nobody like wanted yeah. to read like the horror genre never really broke out and became something like identifiable again in fiction um and i think it still kind of has it um my impression is has always been like stuff that kind of looks like stephen king and zombies that's what horror is yeah that's uh, true. or it's like really like hot like high like literary stuff that is tough to access and get into um so when it got put as so when uh, when uh, 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 Shivers got uh, placed as horror, I was like, uh oh, because that's not what I really wanted to write more of later. <laughs> and yeah. uh, for for then, I did what I think a lot of uh, writers do when they first start out: just kind of cast around, try to figure out what I liked. I wrote um, a noirish uh, like murder mystery that played around with science fiction uh, in the Company Man, and then I wrote The Troop, which is a fantasy about vaudeville. And again, you, and then I wrote, uh, like American elsewhere, which is sort of a weird fiction Lovecraftian. It's a twin peaks meets like HP Lovecraft is what it is. Um, set in, uh, 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 New Mexico. And, um, it wasn't until then that I started to get kind of bored with this stuff. It was, um, you know, I was writing about like America, um, at different ages and moments that like, built the 20th century and the nation that we knew it today. Um, and uh, then I kind of like ran out of things to say about that. I think that the present got too weird for me to really um, begin to find a way to comment upon. And so then I moved into writing secondary uh, uh, fantasy with uh, uh, City of Stairs, um, which was kind of a big jump for me. Uh, I guess looking back on it, but um, really it is sort of the same sort of like the, the stuff that I've always been interested in and in that it is a mystery story. I think all of my books at heart, I think most books at heart are actually a mystery. Um, 
uh, structure because a lot of them are about trying to comprehend the unknown, not understanding something and trying to trying mm-hmm. trying uh, to uh, figure it out. You don't have to have a murder for yeah. it to be a mystery. Um, but it was also a lot about like the urban landscape, history, myths. This is all crap I like. So making that move was, um, I think for some people surprising, but for me, it felt like I was just writing the same old stuff, which is the stuff that I liked. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And I mean, I like that same old crap too, but <laughs> you know, it's like, I think that's why I connect with your books is the fact that, uh, I love weird fiction and I love this kind of, uh, traversal in terms of, uh, you know, things like politics or history or religion and that kind of stuff. And, and so for you, how do you, uh, go about taking those aspects of human society and then infusing them into your fiction and your world building, you know, as someone who I can surmise is an engaged citizen who's aware of things that are going on right now, but also engaged in the past and, and, and taking influences and inspiration from, from what's gone on in human history. Um, I think that a lot of it is looking at the weird bits of history, seeing how things are different or not like us whatsoever. And then kind of like, which helps you kind of comprehend how the present came about. Uh, one thing yeah. that I think is quite interesting um, uh, is looking at the history of Europe in like the 1200s to like the uh, 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 1400s and to realize that the state really did not exist, that uh, there were not cohesive mm-hmm. nations, that there were hierarchies and, le- and le- le- like allegiances between people. but um, that we didn't, but the the but the idea of a state with laws that had boundaries and borders, um, and where um, all the power was comprehensible and focused, was not really a thing. That was not something that people did. And so, like to think about yeah. things like that, and then to compare it to where we are now, that allows you to sort of invent. Um, a mishmash like alternate world in your head where the pre where there are factions and forces that, uh, we, that we are quite, uh, um, uh, familiar with now, but a way to dress them up and make them look different so that we can sort of comprehend it better. If that makes sense. Like if you change things yeah. a little bit, um, and, um, and say like, so is this still the same thing? Is this still the, is, like, is it the same thing now? Is it the same thing now? If I just keep changing it, what is it you know, like in itself? And, um, that kind of makes it like a, a fun way to sort of make a sandbox of history, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And at the same time, it's playing on, on the, uh, nature of, of human history in the sense that, you know, there's a cycl- cyclical nature to civilizations. They are fragile things and it's never guaranteed that they're going to uh, be stable forever. You know, there's the rise and fall of Romans, Egyptians, Greeks, what have you. And, you know, bringing up this period between 1200 to 1400 in European, European history, it's kind of like there was no uh, concrete broad civilization in that sense like you say it's all condensed into these little pockets and how those pockets interact with each other is a mind fuck but it's fun to play with and it gives you that that tool to build an interesting fictional playground sure yeah and like one thing like um there's like like uh like one theory that's out there right now which um is that uh most complex uh societies that formed in like the ancient world were grain based where they like wheat form things like that um and uh like societies that farmed you know stuff that would perish in days or weeks really didn't ever grow to be as complex uh Mm. and the theory is is that if you have a food source that is durable and seasonal and you can store ship around move around um that that both like enables you to be more complex, but also like requires you to be, to be a lot more complex. You have to plan Mm -hmm. 
land use, you have to plan storage, you have to plan shipment, you have to plan ways to do this. And that just makes you create laws. That makes you create uh, 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 complexities. Um, and it's one of those things that if you think about it, it feels like something out of a fantasy story, that there's this mm-hmm. magic fruit or food that just <laughs> makes this society get complex and do weird crap. Um, yeah. And so trying to think of uh, of history in those terms as something strange and, uh, and weird and alien that we don't comprehend makes it a lot easier to take parts of history and pull them into stories uh, that are weird and fantastical. Yeah, and, and you know, in the Founders trilogy, you have the city of Tavan, and then in Divine Cities, you have Bulakov, you know, and I think this complexity that you're talking about is like, having the stability of something that can give you uh long-term growth or long-term uh stability from the perspective of food for instance or just some sort of uh mineral or something that has a certain value to it all of that usually ends up creating cities and these cities continue to grow and grow and grow and i think in both of those trilogies you do a really good job of establishing cities and then using that city as a setting on one hand, but at the same time, giving them a lot of complexity and growth as a living, breathing character in and of itself, uh, not just a, a setting necessarily. So for you, why are cities like such a good uh, starting point for, for these, for these trilogies? Well, I think that the like nature of being human on a grand scale is to take reality and to change it. Mm. to make reality different. Um, And some of that is in the way we change land, but also the way that we build structures that acknowledge abstracts, like who was allowed to live here and who was not. Um, uh, Like the way that you place uh, housing, the way you place industry, the way you place, uh, like the government, that all of it, like the, 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 the place and the nature of the structure that it's in. And like, like anything from like the doors, like how big are the doors? How big are the doors of mm-hmm. your state house? Are they really big? Are they very small? If so, why? Do you not want a lot of people coming in there? Do you not want it public? Do you want it public? If so, like, is that a good idea? Uh, do you want to have a lot of people in the Raptors? Like, one thing that's fun is like, you know, in the uh, French Revolution, you know, when they, uh, I forget exactly w- w- which phase this was, but it was when they, I think they were planning a constitutional um, like monarchy, like in the giant uh, love, like, uh, le- le- uh, like building where they were all planning this stuff. If you were conservative and thought about the king, you just kind of sat on the right. And, uh, and then if you were super radical and wanted to blow, uh, to like blow, like blow everything up, you, you sat on the left. And that's how we got the terms left and right now. It's just yeah, it's crazy, those, isn't it? Just happened to sit down at the moment. Um, mm-hmm. so I think like that cities are a like manifestation of the ways that we change reality as well as the way that those changes change us in turn. Mm-hmm. Um, they are systems and structures that are both planned and unplanned. Yeah. Um, and the part where you really see the city come alive, uh, is, um, when you see the mistakes, when you see the, the fact that you had to le- like design around a stupid or strange little like facet of human <laughs> behavior, uh, that's when it feels very human. It feels very real. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, yeah, that's why it's such a, such a rich uh um like uh like target um yeah no that's that that's why i love that stuff yeah i mean for me personally like i live here in quito in ecuador and this is a a city that has seen so much uh historical layering uh sort of like the stratification of 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 history with the inca influence and the spanish conquistador influence and all of this kind of co-mingles in this space where it's like you go to certain parts of this city it's like this makes no sense like especially the historical center it's like you can barely drive a car here shit's a mess sidewalks have like enough space for a foot like a single foot it's like it doesn't doesn't make any sense but at the same time it does give it character because it uh, like you said, it includes that that human element, which is the uh, 
erroneous nature of our our forethought and being able to plan ahead and our inability to see like ah yeah this street right now is perfect for horses or a carriage or what have you Mm -hmm. but in 200 years 300 years someone's going to bring a car here and it's going to be a disaster but we don't know that because we don't know that technology is is going to exist nor the fact that it could exist based on what we know right now and it's like i love that about cities so so much yeah absolutely and um and then on top of that you you know uh you mentioned sort of how cities change us and that we have the ability to change cities in turn. I think that plays into a lot of themes that you have, especially in the founders trilogy, things like revolutions or industrialization and these, um, these movements that have the ability to change things on a grand scale, but it's kind of difficult to, uh, it's kind of difficult to notice that it's happening when you're in the middle of it, when you're in the thick of it. But then you look back at, through a historical lens, what have you, you realize, wow, this is like a grand revolution, you know, in France, for instance, or various other countries around the world. Yeah. And then in the founders trilogy, it's like, you're in the thick of it with these characters, with Sansia and and her crew, and they're in the middle of a revolution, but sometimes it's like, they're so caught up in it that they don't really, uh, know the scale of what is actually going on. So how did you, how did you kind of approach that whole aspect? Um, one of the big appeals was the the thing that is powerful about uh, like industry is also what we find kind of crappy about it, in that there mm-hmm. is no workmanship, there is no like magic. Yeah. Um, it used to be where like um, uh, if you, for example, bought a chair, then like then it was made by one person who had like like accumulated a huge amount of knowledge and skill and resources to to make this entire thing uh but post in, post like uh like post post industry the chair is made by 40 people 100 people they make this little piece and this little piece and this little piece and this little piece and yeah, no one really again. owns the chair <laughs> If you mix, like, you know, there's this, uh, like, idea that if you mix your, like, labor with something like in the real world, then you kind of own it a bit. But if you're all just making screws, just one screw, and you never even know what it goes into, then you own nothing. Um, And it's the idea of becoming a component in something more complex. Uh, The idea that a system takes something that is unique and a like individual and makes it um just a part uh it makes it a product um and so trying to do that to magic which you know a lot of people want to be you know a fun like like uh like there's one wizard who knows everything but uh to like take that like conceit and to and to use industry to like take it apart um, it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun to make magic shitty and to see what that would do to people. <laughs> and, um, that's, that's what like the whole city does, um, is that it, you, it like, is that it makes people and it makes magic and it makes these, uh, like things that we uh, like identify as being unique. It makes them just, just components, like, like pieces of a whole and it breaks them down. And that's like the real struggle that, uh, uh, that that like Sanchia has throughout the whole story is the idea of a city that is trying to tell you that you are a thing, a system that is trying to take away what makes you you, um, and the yeah. and uh, like in a lot of ways it's just the struggle to use the powers of a, a civilization to like uh, to like empower yourself. That is actually very hard to do. Uh, because as a society gets more complex, you own less and less of yourself and less and less of your life that gets, uh, and that power gets, uh, more concentrated, like in the hands of a few people and trying to maintain that balance is the, the, is the big tricky question, I think. And like in Devon, you can see a system where it's, uh, shifted very much in one direction and trying to see how people use the power of a civilization to stay themselves 
is the uh, it, that's the real struggle. Yeah, and at the same time, this magic system, you know, um, in the divine cities, you have the divinities, and that's intertwined into the very fabric of that city itself. And then in the founders trilogy, you have scribing, which is, from my perspective, like you know, you you talked about it a little bit just then, but it's like this industrial, almost coding like language uh, that is is then used to uh, convey magic, but from an industrial perspective, you know? And so on top of that, you have the, I guess, I don't know how you would call them like demigods, uh, but they're the hierophants in, in, in the series who use scribing as a means of manipulating reality itself, which kind of plays into this whole uh, coding analogy. And so for you beyond, um, giving the uh the world itself and the industrial nature of that city uh, a way of um how would i put this sort of uh using that magic as a means of controlling its populace or at least kind of like putting them into a into a hierarchy at the same time what are some of the other ways that you feel a good magic system can empower your characters or reflect upon the world building or the the world as a whole um i think that like one big rule that i have is that when you are writing a story you have to decide what it is about what's the main conflict um mm -hmm. Like, is this about freedom? Is this about choice? Is this about love? Uh, is this about, you know, uh, art, history, that kind of stuff. Um, and then once you kind of choose what it's about, then you need to make sure that all, uh, that all aspects uh, like of the story refer back to that conflict. Um, so you right. need to make sure that the arc of the characters has to touch on history. You have to make sure that the magic yeah. has to touch on history. This is like when I wrote uh, Like the Divine Cities, um, that's about history. That's about how the world as it used to be and what we know about it and lay, lay, like what we don't know and how we try and uh, like mimic what we think the world used to be, even though it was actually probably quite mm. different. And we use the past to yeah. invent ways to excuse the things that we want to do now in the present. Um, and so the magic system has to point back to that as well. So if you're, if you are doing this well, then it's then like, then you don't really have to worry about if the like characters are like affected by the magic system. It's all the same conversation, mm -hmm. which makes it a lot easier to make it right. feel coherent. Um, and if you have something in there that's just for fun, you know, that has nothing to do with anything, probably a good sign that, um, you need to get rid of that thing. <laughs> it's just extraneous. Just toss it out of there. <laughs> and then on top of that, you know, you mentioned history, but, uh, religion, I think is something that, that, um, you allude to a lot in, especially in your last two trilogies, not necessarily explicit, uh, discussions of any particular religion but you know the divinities in the divine cities is uh, with their saints and all these different kinds of aspects of the society and the way that plays into history um i think is an interesting approach to discussing religion through the extrapolation of a secondary world and then in the founders trilogy you have history and the way that the hierophants and all the uh sort of lost uh, knowledge within that world has a little bit of a religious uh, framing to it. So for you, what, are you, what is your interest in religion in particular? And, you know, from my perspective, you tap into some of the things that uh, show up in, in religious texts that are what I would call like uncanny or uh, very strange and surreal type things. So how did you go about tapping into that sort of like uncanny mythology and religious, uh, religious history? Well, the thing about, uh, like the, um, about, uh, like the divine cities is that it's not really a religion. I think because to me, a religion is a function of faith. 
Um, it is a, a choice about what the world is. And then faith is the commitment to like maintaining that choice. You, you, right. you have to make a leap of faith, I think. But when gods actually show up and start like changing stuff, you don't really need faith. Like they're just right there outside the door. <laughs> That's true. Um, yeah. And so um, I think what was fun about that was trying to use the elements of like religion to acknowledge that like uncanny fact that the gods are real here and we don't understand them at all. Um, and like the pieces that we have of like what they look like and seem like we don't like w- w- they make no sense to us. Um, and so I think that that's kind of, and like the same sort of thing, of like again, uh, like recurs in Foundry side where, but in that one, it feels like a little bit more uh, like alien and, it, and that this is a person or these are people who change themselves so much that they no longer seem mm-hmm. human whatsoever to us. Um, yeah. And I think that like religion sort of acts, I mean, like that is the only lens that you can really look at things that you can't comprehend through. Um, Mm -hmm. If there is something so uncanny and so strange, then it's going to come across as divine or as um, something uh, like, uh, like fantastical. Um, And I think that that's why a lot of, a fantasy that, that that is out there feels faith based. There is a, like an element of like 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 magic or history or myth that feels almost like like religious in concept. Like with mm-hmm. like Tolkien, a lot of that stuff feels like faith based. That there are gods, that there are angels, that there was um, an ancient way of life that was like wonderful before like it was ruined. Um, I think that a lot. Of fantasy trends in that direction, just because that is the best tool that we have to try and talk about something that we can't comprehend. Yeah, but I mean, I I I thought of something like Star Wars, where you have the Jedi and you have the sort of like the myth of lore of the Jedi, and that goes back thousands and thousands of years. Similar to yeah. something like Tolkien, where there's almost this mythologization of of the Jedi and what their uh, belief system is and all that kind of stuff and how that's transcribed into their uh, training manuals, their, their texts and stuff like that. And it very, feels very, very religious, you know, but Mm -hmm. I feel that what you did well to counter this in the founders trilogy, especially is to sort of um, humanize the, the people who are, you know prescribe this sort of deity status you know they have their mythology within history within the context of the book but you give them pov chapters and you flesh out their history and how all of this intertwines all the way through to the end of Locklands is very tied into the nature of the history of this world but also the nature of the characters and you give them that fleshing out experience that for me made it much more engaging to be like uh how how does one question the the truth and the history of this uh this deity or this divine uncanny thing that I can't really explain? Yeah, I think like one of the trickier things with lots lots of fantasy that feels faith oriented or like 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 religious is that at some point in time you have to explain like the religion and it has to make mm-hmm. sense. And with stuff like yeah. the Jedi, you know, at some point you're like, I don't really totally like know exactly what this is that you're doing here. I know <laughs> yeah. it seems cool, you see monks, mm-hmm. um, but then when you actually go back and you see like the Jedi, like and like like all like just just like like doing their thing, you, it, like it doesn't totally make a lot of sense. A lot of it is that you have to go with the flow, and that you know you can't be good and evil, and you can't have a wife and stuff like that, and like balance. Um, and it's, and it, like at some point in time, it kind of breaks down a bit. Um, mm-hmm. the same thing happens with, um, with, I think like a lot, uh, a lot of fantasy that leans into gods, like a whole lot. And that like, like, like if the magic comes from gods, uh, which a lot of it does that you have to call like a blessing down from 
some abstraction. Uh, you kind of have to wonder, like, why does that guy care about this? Like, mm-hmm. what does this guy want to see? What does this guy <laughs> like favor? Um, and uh, it just kind of gets hard to do because we don't like there. You know, that's not something that like has happened uh, in reality, um, as far as we're aware, of course, in a very long time. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so uh, I think like when I start to get into trying to look at that more, I do lean very heavily into making it about people and making yeah. sure that you know that these are people who are making choices. And a lot of them are not great choices. A lot of it is like ugly and messy and uh, like improvised. and it kind of makes it very, uh, you know, it kind of pops the bubble. Like, you know, you have this, uh, this idea that this is someone like fantastical, but I want to go ahead and make sure that you're aware that, you know, really this is just some guy trying to make shit work. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that, that, uh, that a lot of like the big, the big moments in history is mostly just people slapping stuff together, trying to make shit work. Yeah, hundred percent. And and you know, getting a little bit deeper into the founders trilogy with the characters, especially, you know, pretty much everyone is just trying to make shit work uh with whatever they have available around them. And so you have characters like Sancha and I'm trying to like imagine in my head how to say this with like an Italian accent, even slightly like Berenice or something like that. Um Yeah, that's the proper way to say it. <laughs> and when I realized that after like, you know, like like, like I have to admit. Uh, once I realized that that was how that was pronounced, I was like, "Oh, I didn't, I, I didn't think of that one." <laughs> um, maybe she's just le- like Berenice, but yeah, it should be Nietzsche. Yeah, whoops. Yeah, <laughs> it's all good, man. I mean, people are reading it on the yeah. page for the most part, but we have the opportunity yeah. to say them out loud and butcher it completely. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but for you, what makes a sort of like an ideal pr- protagonist for you to write? Because you started Foundry Side mostly from uh, Sancho's perspective, but then you flesh that out, uh, and Berenice ends up becoming really integral to the whole thing. And essentially you have these two queer hackers, thieves, lovers, wives, and they're kind of like the core of this, uh, of this cast of characters, uh, over the course of the trilogy. So for you, what makes, uh, an ideal protagonist, but also what made these two characters fit for the story that you wanted to tell? Uh, I think one thing that really makes it work is that they have to feel fragile. Um, there are a bunch of stories out there where the like the like main character feels unbreakable or just too cool for school. Yeah. Um, and like you have to make them like a little bit broken in some way because we're all kind of broken. Um, and if you don't have a part of the story where they feel frail um, or they feel broken, then I think it's going to be a lot harder for it to feel compelling. Um, mm, yeah. There, so there's that aspect. And I also think that you, that you have to be really clear in what they want. Like, what are they trying to get out of this story? Um, and you can say survive because that's what a lot uh, a lot of stories are about is just someone trying to stay alive. But it has to be something that is a little bit a little bit more abstract. And again, like that strikes close to the heart of the theme of the story. If it's about history or, or like whatever, um, that that you have to be clear that that the stakes for this character refer back to that and are and and uh, and, and is quite clear. Um, and so you get to see because, and like, so one thing that I like is to see how, how people change over time. Um, I don't, I like the idea of trying to write a story where it's all, where like all the books take place within like three to four years of someone's life or less. Um, that seems kind of lame to me. I Mm -hmm. want to see them change over like five, 10, 20 years. Um, I want to see them like, you know, their concept of the self change. Um, and that's one of the fun things about like foundry side. I think that actually that some people were surprised that they that had like, what is it? A two year jump from book one, book two, and then an eight year jump from book two to three, I think. Yeah. Um, yeah. Something along those lines. Um, I think some people were surprised by that. And I think it's because um, a lot of 
fiction these days is either YA or YA approximate, like close to it, and that it feels mm-hmm. kind of YA. I think a lot of people thought that that the uh, Foundry site world was going to function more like YA. But the thing about like YA stuff is that they got to stay young. Like once they get mm-hmm. to be like 25, like you can't do that anymore. Now they're old people. That sucks. <laughs> um, 25 is why. old these days. <laughs> 25 is old these days. Yeah. Once they're like 30, <laughs> man, fuck that. Um, and I get why, why it like works because like um, a young adult as a former young person um, is someone who doesn't have a huge amount of power. Um, but also doesn't have a huge amount of like, like obligations. They don't have like, mm, they, they yeah. probably don't have a lot of debts. They probably don't have a lot of property. Um, they probably don't have a lot of failed marriages. They probably don't have kids. Mm-hmm. Um, so they are like unencumbered. Um, they don't have a lot of control, which is a, which is great in like a protagonist. You can like make them do stuff, like force them into corners and things like that. And, mm-hmm. um, and also, uh, they're highly like emotional. They look their best and they're horny. This is great stuff. <laughs> um, this is like cheat code stuff for a, yeah. a like protagonist. But, um, you know, as I get older, a lot of like, um, I, I really want to look at how these like characters change like over time. And I think that one of the fun things about this book is seeing how Sancha changes. And she starts out being like, um, like an action oriented thief. Of, um, and then who is there to break the system and to see how her concept of herself changes. And she becomes someone who I think has a much wiser conception of how the world works and is mm-hmm. much more accepting of what the world will do to her yeah. uh, and what's interesting is that uh, like like uh, like Berenice she changes as well where she will where she becomes much more like action oriented where her whole like being is built on trying to save what they have left and to save Sancha um, because without her um, they, like she can't conceive of a world like, like without this person. Um, mm-hmm. And it was really fun to see that. Like that's why I write books is to see how how people change. Um, and so the idea of like trying to keep them at the same age, like in the same problems, like that seems crazy pants now. Having like like <laughs> these two books. Yeah. Because, I mean, as a reader, from my perspective, that change felt very, um, it felt very uh, genuine to me because obviously there are these time jumps, you know, two years, three years uh, between book one and two, eight years between book two and three. The progression seems natural based on the circumstances, but also the world around them and how that is changing also feels like it necessitates that time jump. Because the amount of stuff yeah. that that has changed between those time periods is, you know, from a reader's perspective, it's pretty drastic. You know, there's a lot going on mm-hmm. in terms of the technology and how people are using scribing and different uh, different uh, technologies that are available to them. And at the same time, it is more interesting for me personally to see how. Sancha and Berenice's relationship is evolving over that time. Like you say, they become, uh, Sancha becomes a little bit more wiser, more pragmatic, but also more loving and, and able to trust in other people. Whereas Berenice is like, I was really like, holy shit, she's like the war general uh, in this society in book three. And I was just like, wow, that was not like a role that I would have expected of her, but she steps up to that plate and you can see how that change naturally fits into her. And then beyond that, you have all these other side characters and how that interplay throughout the series, Clef, uh, Gregor, uh, Orso, all these different characters, really, uh, their relationships really develop or you can see the strain, you can see the heartbreak and the tragedy and all of that. And so I feel like 
you did a really good job of using the characters and their relationships and the time jumps that you had uh, between each books to play with the emotional stakes in a very effective way. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I love that stuff. That's like why I write is to mm. have these things where you see like the time jumps and see, see how books change. Mm -hmm. um, like, but it is a cheat too, uh, because like, you know, a lot of people like love the first book of a series because the first book is, is always, um, like, an, is it like, is always about like, uh, about like escape, uh, where there's this new thing that you get to jump into and you don't know anything about what's going on. Right. Um, and the second of a series usually kind of feels a little bit more lame because you know <laughs> how it all works now. But if you do a time jump, uh, then when you, you know, it's kind of the same characters and they're, but they have all kinds of new crap happening and the world's yeah. changed, then that makes it feel new again. And that's mm -hmm. how like life is. I think, um, mm -hmm. th like that was inspired by, um, by, uh, halt and catch fire, which is a great show, which like inspired some of this stuff. And then it's, you know, tech, tech focus, like trying to slap shit together and make it work sort of stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, but each season, it had, had a huge time jump of, like, years. Um, and so you got to see throughout, see how, like, tech changed from, like, the 80s through the 90s. Um, and it worked really well, where each time that you had, like, a new season, you were like, I have no idea what's happening with these people anymore. <laughs> As opposed to, I want to see what, like, you know, I know that it's the exact same thing again, so I'll just watch. Um, you know, like, like you know, it, it's... It adds a, like an element of like mystery to it that I think works quite well. Yeah. And at the same time, it's like, as an author, you have cheat codes available to you. If it feels appropriate, fucking use it because sometimes yeah. it's very advantageous and it works and it's very uh, beneficial for you from a creative perspective because it keeps things uh, fresh and allows you to sort of take established characters and reestablish them within a new context. And then mm -hmm. for the readers as well, it gives them the opportunity to avoid, uh, oh, this book is this book is lame in comparison to its predecessor. And so I'm now reinvested in this character that I'm already familiar with, but recontextualizing what's going on around them and how they adjust to these new settings, I think is perfectly reasonable for you to be like, okay, I got this cheat code, use it, let's go. <laughs> yeah, it's a lot of fun. Yeah. And uh, something else that I wanted to touch on, we talked about the magic system of uh, scribing earlier, which for me, you know, feels very much like coding. But uh, as a whole, I think this is very prevalent in in Foundry side, but you have elements of it in, in uh, Shorefall and Locklands as well. But this sort of uh, aesthetic that you've got going on for me is very much like a hacker vibe with like the tech and uh, the heists and the counterculture attitude uh especially sancha in the in the first book uh and for me is very reminiscent of cyberpunk um and oh, i think yeah. uh, i read somewhere that dan wells called your called foundry side like the best cyberpunk uh book this year even though it's fantasy which i thought was perfect because yeah. um it fits very much into that vein but you give it this uh fantasy uh this uh fantasy in sort of capsule you know what i mean and so how did you yeah. play on that genre in a fantasy setting when was that purposeful from the beginning yes it was like i think it, when i start a new series i usually like i don't like what i try and do is to take a different genre and then just dress it up like a fantasy story so with uh yeah. like city of stairs it's really a spy story dressed up as um as a fantasy and that there are and that like gods are like nuclear bombs you don't want someone to mm -hmm. get a hold of one so it's a race to try and stop it, someone like, it's like a spy story where someone yeah. where you are trying to race to stop someone from getting it in foundry side mm -hmm. i did come out and say like yeah this is gonna be a, a cyberpunk that looks like a fantasy it's gonna have beards and swords and magic but it's gonna be cyberpunk um yeah and uh like yeah that was a, that was like the plan from step one to do that nice um, the, uh, thing that is trickier is, um, was what's fun about cyberpunk is the transhumanist like aspects. Mm -hmm. Um, 
like one of the things there were like lots of reasons why um oh come on scarlett johansson movie the like adaptation of the anime i can't think of ah uh, ghost in the shell ghost in the shell lots of things so that sucked about that adaptation but one of them was just that like it didn't seem that interested in the idea of ai at all um mm-hmm. and like the idea of like a like religious uh, a concept of trying to merge a human mind with with AI, yeah, and that yeah that was boring. That sucked. Um, <laughs> and so the like like what is fun about cyberpunk is seeing how people take these tools and use them to change themselves and become something more. Um, the thing that is was trickier about uh, that with like fantasy was, you know, I had these bits that I made. Um, like uh like in shorefall and then quickly realizing like if someone if they just like practically i mean like there there is an obvious use for this and mm-hmm. if they use it it will obviously change like civilization for absolutely ever yeah and like i had a moment of like do i really want to do this like this is going to be like fucking <laughs> crazy like this is some yeah. weird shit here and then i was like yeah i guess yeah. it got to man where there's this thing that they invent that like changes like everything. It changes what it means to be human. If they're like mm-hmm. they are post human, uh, in yeah. in like Lockman's. Yes, because they they essentially reach a point of just like, I don't know. It's like the scribing singularity or something where yes. you know there is this this ultimate trajectory of this technology, and and for me, it's absolutely fascinating that that you were able to create a magic system that fit in a fantastical world, but at the same time uh, was very reminiscent of cyberpunk. And like you mentioned, allowed this ability for uh, commentary on transhumanist or post-humanist uh, notions of science fiction and, and even, you know, real life futurists and people who are involved in AI and stuff like that. And so it really melded in a natural way. And then reading Locklands, I was like, yeah, it makes sense. As I said earlier, sometimes the time jump is a necessity based on what is going on in the world. And some of the advances that are made through scribing and, uh, you know, the people who are applying that on a grander scale, it's like, yeah, that eight years feels good because shit would change and it would change drastically and you need to have a little bit of leeway in order to make that feel uh natural and comfortable for where the people are at that given time yeah yeah that 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 really sums it up that was kind of my thinking and trying to and have to do the eight years jump Mm -hmm. yeah and then on top of that you know how does it allow you to uh comment on our current technological revolution without being so in your face in the way that that science fiction or cyberpunk can sometimes be well it's kind of it's kind of tricky because i'm one of the people who thinks that scientific progress has kind of stalled out a little bit in the past 20 or 30 years um and so trying to come trying to talk about the present in cyberpunky and like, you know, the fun transhumanist like cyberpunky terms, uh, it's probably not going to work, I think. But, um, you know, in, um, I do think that it does touch on it in some ways though. And that a lot of it is just that someone like the, so there's magic in this book where someone takes something and puts something in your mind. And then after that, you become a murderous, crazy person who mm-hmm. does horrible things <laughs> to themselves and to others. And I was like, yeah. yeah, that's exactly what it's like to be on social media where you, <laughs> you know, just look at your phone and someone puts something mm-hmm. in your mind and then like the rest of your day is ruined. Um, or yeah. you just go absolutely crazy and start to like believe a bunch of crazy shit. And then you can't come, you can't come over for dinner anymore uh, because no one wants to listen to your <laughs> ranting. Um, yeah. so I think that that, like, you know, I don't think a lot of people are going to read that corollary too much, uh, in Lachlan's, Mm -hmm. uh, but it's definitely there. Like, I think that, you know, part of technology is just like, you know, again, to come full circle is realizing how little you own yourself and Mm. the, 
like the times that we succeed is when it's less about like ownership than exchange, than consensual like giving. Uh, I I am giving my time, my thought, my life, my data, whatever, um, up toward uh, up for this purpose, for this thing. This is a good use of me. Um, and uh, I think that that's sort of the question that we have uh, that we have in the future. Um, as well as you know, like the the thing that was tricky about this like series is um, you know is that they build and make a lot of new stuff and like they have these li- like li- like wondrous things that they make and use a whole whole lot and the problem of today is that we have all these like wonderful things and we don't use them we don't want them mm-hmm. we don't want to build a whole bunch of new homes we don't want to build a bunch of like power plants that can produce carbon-free power. Uh, we don't want to take vaccines. We don't want to make it easy to get this pill, like if you get sick. We just don't want to do this stuff. It's kind of a big pain in the ass. Um, and so that's one of the ways that I find that the world is like way different from how we think about technology. We think about te- technology as this yeah. like, great thing that changes everything. But like we have all these like things around us that are wonderful that we just kind of don't want uh, to use. Uh, mm-hmm. So that's kind of weird. That's the that's one way that I feel like Foundry Site is different from reality. Yeah, but in the same way, I think uh, you know the series as a whole. I like how you have that duality in in Lockland's, especially of sort of I would call it like mind virus zombies who are sort of sucked into the bullshit of the internet and kind of getting wrapped up in yeah. uh, nonsense and what have you. But on the flip side, you have a society that. Um, is based on uh consensual give and take and the technology is the uh is the medium through which that exchange is made but the fact that it is consensual means that there is complete uh transparency in terms of what is being given and what is being taken and i think obviously in comparison to the real world there is such a lack of transparency from the technology mm-hmm. companies that are that are uh you know running social media platforms or who are making uh all the products that we're making um a lot of the time the exchange doesn't really feel uh it doesn't really feel uh justified or it doesn't feel uh fair for a lot of people and then on top of that top of that you have like the bullshit of governments and all these different institutions and so i think you know framing the conversation the way you did in the in the trilogy however subtle people will pick up on it however they will but at the very least for me as a reader that's the kind of thing that i pick up on that subtext and that is the sort of subtext that i put into my brain and then it lingers there and then eventually it becomes something that transmorphs into the conversation that we're having or conversations that i have with my wife or my friends or whoever is interested in that kind of stuff. And that is sort of like the small scale change that will hopefully have a ripple effect across broader, uh, across bo- uh, broader um, communities and, and countries and eventually the whole world. I mean, it's a little bit utopian, but at the same time, we got to hope for something better or else we're, we're fucked in the end, you know? Yes. Yeah. We, yeah, I, I, I do think that um, I'm not sure what the future is going to look like, but I th- think that people, yeah, like one thing that I think is tough is that if you were to go back a hundred years and say technology, they would think like factories, uh, planes, yeah. cars, power plants. But now, like today, you say technology, and it really just means like the transfer, uh, like of information. If it's you know yeah. by keyboard yeah. or by camera or by like audio, it is really just like the way to zip around stuff we know to like mm-hmm. analyze and collect and, and use it. And I think a lot yeah. of that, you know, is a switch that happened around, uh, around uh, like in the seventies and eighties, which is, uh, like also that's like the, like the same time that we had, uh, the create, like the rise of like wall street as well. We started to fly like finance things in much more complex ways. Um, that's also like when cyberpunk was created. Like, you know, it used yeah. to be that science fiction was rocket ships and um, all sorts of cool stuff like that. 
And then in the 70s and 80s, it switched in like it became cyberpunk. Um, and so I think that we're starting to come to the like, like, like realization that tech needs to be more than just this. That this has mm-hmm. inbuilt like, uh, like exploitation that is not helpful. That we're kind of reaching the end uses of, I feel like. You know, there's that thing that we say, like again and again, that the like brightest minds of like our generation are in San Francisco trying to get you to click on an app, on, on, like on an ad. Yeah. Thing. Um, and I think that people, that I think that we are starting to like realize that this sucks and that technology needs to be something much larger than this. It's just taking yeah. time for us to come to that, that, uh, that realization, I think. Yeah. I mean, uh, I guess you could call it the, the vaccine to the, the mind virus that's going on across society. And hopefully, yeah, you know, it, it takes a single mind to wake themselves up. Uh, it's ultimately an individual choice. And um, I think that is something that that cyberpunk did well, which is kind of take the the spaceships and the grand ideas of science fiction and condense it down to individual agency, despite how uh, often fucked up and destitute that agency was based on the societal uh, uh, hierarchies or whatever. Um, but right now we have the capability to figure out shit, you know, parse through all the, all the information and, and come to a conclusion that it's like, this is what's best for me, my health, my family, uh, the things that I enjoy, the things that I want to create. And eventually, you know, I think, uh, like I was saying earlier, revolutions don't necessarily, um, feel like revolutions when you're in the midst of it, but you know, once we come out the other end, we'll look back on it and be like, holy crap, why did I waste so much fucking time on Instagram or whatever, just like on my phone, just perusing through bullshit? And why didn't yeah. I spend more time creating or enacting some sort of change or for the geniuses in, in San Francisco or wherever they are? Why didn't you spend more time coming up with cleaner energy solutions or or uh, some other grander necessity that that the earth is is uh suffering from you know mm-hmm. absolutely and uh now that Locklands is almost out uh we'll transition away from from technology and and uh all that but how does it feel to finish another trilogy and what's that transition period uh like between new creative endeavors um yeah the the way that I think about like trying to finish up a series and try and start something new is this a, is that it's a lot like trying to sell a house before you can move into the house, or trying to get like divorced. <laughs> like I'm like you know, like my marriage is over. I've met someone new. I want to move on, but I can't. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, it's yeah. that weird sort of phase, <laughs> and like um, and so you get into this weird place now where like I got to go and do things like this where i talk about this book when like like my brain i'm like man i have moved on from that a while ago i'm trying to do like some new stuff now um yeah uh especially with the end of a trilogy like a trilogy is a really big thing and the last one is always the hardest to write because it is in conversation with all the previous like moments of the story um so trying to write the trilogy really is like you know where you have to put put the key like uh when you like like the way that they that they used to build the ar- like arches you know they would have like the frame in the center and then you would like pop out the frame mm-hmm. like when it was done the like the last yeah. one the last uh piece of like a series is when you pop out that frame you know like, i don't know if this shit's <laughs> cool. gonna stay standing um <laughs> so uh like each thing that you like each moment requires a lot more thought the same thing is true in like a climax um like like when you write a climax like time dilates like on on previous like at the start of the story um you might only spend like you know three or three to four words on one second of time like if that Mm -hmm. makes sense like uh folks can just walk around uh in one paragraph and move like across the city and a climax you can't do that and a climax, like each second requires its own paragraph. Um, and that's especially true 
when uh, it is the climax of a closing like installment. Like that's even like each moment yeah. is even bigger. So it is oddly more like labor intensive to write those. Um, and so the, uh, and so that makes it a lot easier to want to jump to something new. You want to escape into something new that does not require that, that does not require this level of like intensity and, um, and, uh, just focus, if that makes sense. It's like a high stress. Yeah, level. totally. <laughs> yeah. Cause I mean, it's like, you're wrapping up everything and in the back of your mind, you're like, I got all these threads that I need to tie together. And then at the same time, you need to write a a climax and then a, a denouement, a, a ending that satisfies you, but something that you hope will satisfy readers as well. So it's, yeah, that pressure mm -hmm. I imagine is pretty, is pretty intense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then for, is. you know, and then for that, for that next project that you, I guess you've been working on it since, uh, you know, late 2021, ever since you finished uh, Locklands, or at least thinking about it and then working on it mm -hmm. since then, what, uh, what's going on through your mind in terms of uh, that next project? You don't have to spoil anything or give anything away, but are you thinking about doing like a standalone or another series or what's, what's your plan? Uh, I'm thinking about a series. I'm not certain, like uh, with all uh like like uh like genre fiction usually um the the idea of a series will exist like depends a lot on how the first one does it doesn't do well it's not going to be a series it's just going <laughs> to be a sample. yeah um but i'm thinking the the way i'm thinking about it is um you know like i said where i like to take a genre and dress it up as fantasy you know, i did it with spies and this one I did with cyberpunk. And so I'm kind of leaning more into the idea of, the, of a murder mystery um, set in a fantasy world where, you know, you've got someone who was killed, you've got your detective, and then you've got your genius who is there to be like insufferable and solve things. Um, <laughs> that idea is a lot of fun in a, like a fantasy environment. It's also a lot simpler too. Um, because one thing about Foundry Side and Shortfall and the rest of them, they were very complex books. Um, yeah. These systems were extremely complex. The technology was complex. I would get notes back from oh, like my editor that was like, can you do this but make this more delightful and a little bit more genius? <laughs> you know, like, like do that thing that is like super cool that you do. And I'd be like, yeah. man, I don't know how I fucking did that thing the first time. Um, so um, the idea of having... Um, uh, something where, like, the idea of a puzzle box is a lot of fun uh, to me. I love, like, escape rooms and things like that. Yeah. And so the idea of, a, like, unwinding uh, complexity as opposed to trying to make the complex more complex at the moment is highly, like, appealing to me. That sounds awesome though. And I imagine for you, it's kind of like the scale is everything is just kind of scaling down. And so it's like, you have a different kind of complexity, but within a smaller framework and, you know, like an, an escape room or a mystery that you have to unravel is a lot uh, different than, you know, the ever expanding complexity that you see throughout the founders trilogy. Yeah, and most fantasy stuff where it gets larger and gets a lot more complex as it goes along. And a lot of the times very unwieldy. <laughs> yeah, a lot of times really unwieldy. Yeah, I uh, I didn't ever get done with um uh what was it? Uh like Wheel of Time. Um that was one of those mm -hmm. ones where it zipped by me. Uh but I did read the summary like the last one and wow, it seemed like extremely complex. That's the kind of thing that I'm trying to avoid. Yeah. And I mean, 14 books is a lot different than writing trilogies. I, least, I think at least this, this gives you the opportunity to confine your, your playground a little bit, at least enough that you can flesh out your ideas in an effective way, but not draw it out for so long that it's like Robert Jackson Bennett is writing the 16th foundry uh, founders trilogy or like founders series book or something like that. I think it's a, uh, that's a, pretty hefty task for any author to want to invest in a world to that degree. Yeah. Yep. That's definitely true. Yeah. 
And uh, closing out, uh, if you can share with viewers and listeners just a recommendation, something that you're, uh, you know, reading, watching, or listening to. Uh, right now, I am listening to 1491, uh, which is the Charles C. Mann uh, book about basically what the, the like Americas were like before Columbus. It's really interesting. Ooh, cool. It refutes a lot of our preconceived like notions of like indigenous people and the idea of uh, a, like a pure, untouched, untamed, like wilderness. I really like that. You know, he looked into the idea like that, that, that might actually be bullshit. Um, that, and that they were people just like us. I mean, like that's something that I feel mm -hmm. um, that I found quite, quite fascinating. Um, shows to watch. Yeah. Uh, I highly recommend uh, uh, Pachinko uh, on Apple Plus. It's the Ooh, adaptation nice. of the novel. Um, it was like a, a bestseller, and it was I think it won uh, the like National Book Award. It is heartbreaking. Like uh, I think I cry about every single episode. Uh, but it, it's very good at uh, good at what it does. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've been meaning to to watch that one. I read the book, and yeah, I'm just kind of curious, like how how they're going to adapt it. But the 1491 book sounds amazing because, you know, I've been I love history, and I've been I've been delving a little bit into you know things like North American history before you know pre-Columbian times, all that kind of stuff. And like you say, like our preconceived notions of what the indigenous peoples of North America were like, it's like they had civilization, but it's just you know. They had cities and all this different kind of stuff, but our perception of their history is masked by colonialism and and the unfortunate uh uh what's the the adage of uh history is written by the winners kind of thing. So yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that sounds fantastic. And, you know, Robert, I really appreciate you taking the time to chat with me today. And I highly recommend everyone uh, check out his work. You can find Locklands and all your other books in the usual places, Amazon, et cetera. But please support your brick and mortars if you can. And Robert, if you can please tell listeners and viewers where they can find you on social media and how to keep up with uh, everything that you're doing. Uh, I tweet a lot. I'm at twitter.com uh, forward slash Robert J. Bennett is my handle, I believe. Robert J. Bennett. I, I changed my name a lot for fun. So I think right now <laughs> it's Fuds Ruckers, I think yeah. is my name. I'm not sure. <laughs> Something like that. Uh, but um, yeah, that, that's where I do a lot of stuff. Um, and I wouldn't bother looking for me anywhere else. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think uh, you got to have a little bit of fun on, on Twitter as much as you can. Just make uh, social media yeah. a more enjoyable place in general. So. Trying yeah, to. but thank you. Yeah, but thank you so much for for chatting with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you.